Well, good morning, church. Good morning, everybody. Great day to be with our church family. Good to see all of y'all here this morning. Good to see some faces that we haven't seen in a while. Yeah. And we're just glad our online audience is with us as well. We're uh, glad, uh, always glad you stop by and take the, take the time and make the effort to, to worship with us. It's going to be a good day. So I wanted to start by um, reminding you, some of you probably already know, that this is the last Sunday of September. It's almost October. It's, it's uh, 90 days, I think, then, uh, to Christmas, <laughs> if you can believe that. Less than 90 days, I believe. I didn't mean it. I didn't mean to cause any undue anxiety or anything. Sorry about that. today. Yeah. But uh, as you know, as you may know, today is the supposed to be the last day of our anatomically correct sermon series. But I was saying to someone earlier, uh, there's just so much uh, additional material that uh, we'd like to cover. We're going to stretch this thing out a little bit. So we're going to uh, keep going until the first Sunday of November with this sermon series. So just in case you come next week and we're still doing it, you wonder what's going on that that's one. So, uh, uh, one other thing I wanted to mention: we got a new uh, together newsletter. Uh, you'll find that on our literature desk back there, our literature table back there. That's our our district newsletter. So you can find out all that's going on in the British Isles North District of the Church of Nazarene. There. So check one of those out. Anything else? We're going to ask our church secretary, Leslie, to give us a few announcements and to read our scripture for us as well. Good morning. Uh, this is the last week for the alabaster offering. If you have anything to uh, give in for that alabaster offering, it's described in the newsletter. Uh, just mark your envelopes, alabaster, if you want to give to that. And some people, I think, have brought the, the little alabaster boxes that they save up in. So. Uh, and that's that's this week. Then uh, don't forget our Wednesday prayer and Bible study. We had a really good discussion last week. Last yes. Wednesday, yes. we had a nice time. Yes. So yes. if you'd like yes. to hold on to that, it's at seven o'clock on a Wednesday night. And then our common ground on Thursday, the Italian night was an absolute great success. And this week it'll be macaroni cheese. And there's a menu for October there up at the back if you want to take one of the menus and find out what you'll be getting every Thursday. That would be great. The doors open at 4.30 for soup and rolls and then the dinner is at 5 o'clock if you'd like to come along. I think it's very, very popular. Pastor Steve is speaking at Strathclyde House this Thursday at 7. <laughs> and next Sunday is Harvest Sunday and Pastor Tash is going to tell us more about that. Yeah, so for Harvest Sunday we are going to be taking up a collection for our local Mark's food bank. And uh, so it, we're looking for you to bring uh, shelf-stable pantry items like tinned meats, tinned fruit, tinned soup, uh, biscuits, toiletries, things like that. Of course, if you'd like to give a monetary donation, that would be great as well. Just uh, put it in an envelope and mark that um, harvest or food bank and drop it in the, um, the box at the back. Um, you know, our large food bank relies on our donations and volunteers, and it is such an important, um, it's a vital uh, resource for our community. And, uh, you know, and I've always, I've known that for ages, but since beginning to volunteer there, and John, you know, you volunteer there regularly, um, Wendy, you as well, it, you know that I mean, interacting with the, the folks that come, that it is, it's not just a, a resource for food and items like that, but companionship <coughs> as well, and fellowship and camaraderie. And so, um, so we'd like to support them in, uh, on Harvest Sunday. Sure. Yeah. Large Nass has had a long relationship, long with, relationship. The, with the food bank, yeah. so we want to continue to, to help to them. bless them. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Our 
scripture reading for today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verses 6 to 11, and it's printed in your bulletin that you have here. Luke writes, On another Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught, and there was a man there whose right hand was withered. The scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would cure on the Sabbath, so that they might find an accusation against him. Even though he knew what they were thinking, he said to the man who had the withered hand, Come and stand here. He got up and stood there. <coughs> then Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? To save life or to destroy it? After looking around at all of them, he said to them, Stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was restored. But they were filled with fury and disgust with one another what they might do to Jesus. <coughs> this is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Thank you. Before we go to worship this morning, we want to uh, have a time of prayer. And we want to remember, especially uh, our friends and family and millions of others. Uh, in South Carolina and Florida and Tennessee and North Carolina and Georgia who have just been devastated uh, by this hurricane. I mean, it's just, we've seen what, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. You know, I've, I've lived through a lot of hurricanes and I've never seen anything like this that's so widespread and so, uh, so destructive. Uh, so let's, uh, let's remember them. Midland Valley, if you're watching, we're remembering you this morning. Midland Valley is gonna meet for worship this morning even though they don't have electricity. So that, uh, we're praying for y'all. So let's, uh, let's go to prayer. Um, Andy, would you pray for us? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence with us this morning. We thank you that you're here and you're here to bless us. And you're here to look into our lives and help us know all the great things that are bothering us or that we worry about. We thank you Lord for that. We pray for those of our number who are not here through sickness. Amen. We pray you would go get to them and heal them and bring them back to those that are not here because of the holiday. Give them a good time of refreshing Lord, bring them back too soon. And we pray for our friends and loved ones across the US who are going through a terrible time. We know Lord you're already right in the midst of that. You're already working there. We don't have to ask you to get involved because you're already there. We just pray, Lord God, for everyone there, Lord God, and for everyone in this world who needs hope that you are the hope. Yes. We just pray, Lord God, for blessing this morning. <clears throat> for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Remembering that this is a place where you feel free to worship however you are led. If you want to stand, please feel free to stand. If you want to raise your hand, if you want to weep, I'll weep right along with you. So let's let's worship this morning.
synoptic writers share with us. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it's Luke's version that we're going to be looking at today. And it is the story of Jesus healing while he's teaching in the synagogue one Sabbath day a man with a withered hand. And he does this healing in front of the scribes and the Pharisees. And those scribes and Pharisees are not happy about it. And already you may be thinking, you may have been thinking that you heard Leslie read that uh, scripture for us, that this story sounds an awful lot like the one that we began this series with. And you would be correct about that. Because in that story that we looked at back on the 25th of August, Jesus was walking down the street with some scribes and Pharisees, and they were watching Jesus closely. And when he encountered a man with drops, a man who was all swollen, and Jesus asked the scribes and the Pharisees if it was legal to heal on the Sabbath, and they didn't answer him. So Jesus grabbed that man and healed him and set him free. And that story happens in chapter 14 of Luke's Gospel. But today we're going to look at a story that happened several chapters before in chapter 6 of Luke's Gospel. But like several encounters in the Gospels between Jesus and the scribes and the Pharisees, it also revolves around the question of what's legal or what's permissible to do on the Sabbath. Some scholars call these the Sabbath controversies. You'll find several of them in the, in the Gospels. And this Sabbath controversy that we find in verses 6 through 11 of Luke's Gospel follows right after another 
Sabbath controversy. Because in verses 1 through 5 of chapter 6, right before it, we find Jesus and his disciples walking through a cornfield on the Sabbath. And they pick some grain and eat because they're hungry. And the Pharisees who are watching say, Aha, gotcha. You're working on the Sabbath. That's unlawful. And Jesus doesn't agree. And that brings us to today's scripture. And these verses that we heard during worship describe another situation that occurs on another Sabbath, not in a cornfield and not on the street going to the house of a Pharisee, like in chapter 14, but actually in the synagogue, in church on the Sabbath. Now you have this scripture in your notes and you can refer to it as we follow along. Now, if you look at it, on the one hand, this this uh, scripture is a simple narrative. It's only six verses, and there's only three characters named there: Jesus and a man with a withered hand, and the scribes and the Pharisees. And they're only in one location. They're all at the synagogue on one particular day, the Sabbath. The plot, the action that takes place, is pretty straightforward. Jesus is teaching in the synagogue basically the equivalent of our being at church on a Sunday. And there's a man there in need of healing. So the scribes and the Pharisees watch Jesus to see what he'll do. And Jesus tells the man to stand up and he asks the crowd whether it's lawful to do good or evil to save life or destroy it on the Sabbath. And no one answers. So Jesus heals the man and the scribes and Pharisees are furious pretty easy to understand on the one hand but on the other hand there is more going on here than meets the eye there is more here than just a story of Jesus giving a needy man some assistance giving this man a helping hand when he needs one there is more here than just a handout more here than just offering a hand up and more than the scribes and Pharisees plotting to gain and maintain the upper hand over Jesus. Because Jesus' presence and actions in the synagogue and elsewhere are a world-changing proclamation that the kingdom of God is at hand. That the hand of God is at work in history. But the scribes and the Pharisees will do all they can to ensure that their little world does not change. That they'll see to it that things don't get out of hand. <laughs> I'd like to suggest this morning. Pastor, could you bring me a glass of water? I'd like to suggest this morning that one helpful way of approaching these verses is to look individually at the three characters that uh, are named here. And and uh, I just want to suggest that we ask them a question. Thank you very much. So let's look at the three characters that Luke presents to us in these verses. These three characters who happen to be on hand in the synagogue on this particular Sabbath. And let's ask them a very simple question. And that simple question is this. What are you doing here? Why are you here in this synagogue on the Sabbath? And what are you doing? And as we ask this question, first of the scribes and the Pharisees <clears throat> and second of the man with the withered hand and finally of Jesus I believe that we will hear a powerful message for each and every one of us gathered in this place today both as individuals and as the church body so let's begin by looking at the scribes and the Pharisees and asking them as they're in this synagogue let's ask them what are you doing here? Now to start with, the answer is obvious. They're the scribes and the Pharisees. Where else are they going to be on Sabbath day? They're the religious leaders. They're the experts in what the law requires. And they make it their business to make sure that folks adhere to the long list of regulations that they and their tradition have created. And they are scrupulously careful to make sure that it appears that they themselves have the cleanest hands of anyone 
that they are the most righteous. And so they are at the synagogue on the Sabbath day because they are careful to honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. They're here because they have a certain reputation to uphold. They are at the synagogue as they always are because it's their duty. While all this is implied, Luke gives us some additional information about their motives at the synagogue on this particular Sabbath. Because as they were doing in that cornfield at the beginning of this chapter, and as they will be doing when they're walking down the street with Jesus in chapter 14, they are watching Jesus. Luke tells us in verse 7 that these scribes and Pharisees watched Jesus to see whether he cured on the Sabbath so that they might find an accusation against him. They're hoping to witness Jesus in an act of desecrating the Sabbath. They want to catch him red-handed and expose him as a lawbreaker, as a fraud. They want to create a situation in which they can call his bluff and force his hand. So, there are some scholars who suggest that the scribes of the Pharisees have set this situation up. That perhaps they have invited this man with this deformity, this withered hand, in order to entice Jesus into performing this work of healing on the Sabbath so they could accuse him in front of the crowd of others who would have certainly been there as well. But, but whether they had invited him or not, and I don't think they did, to be honest, they do seem to know that the man is there. And here's an interesting thing about that. The situation here in chapter 6 is unlike the situation with the man with dropsy in chapter 14 because that takes place on a street out in the open. But this situation takes place in the synagogue. And that matters <coughs> because in Leviticus 21, the diseased and disabled and deformed like the man with dropsy and this man with withered hand would have been labeled as unclean and precluded from the synagogue. And in fact, he'd be required to let folks in any crowd uh, know that he was unclean and that they should avoid contact with him. And the scribes and the Pharisees would have known this better than anyone. But despite the fact that they've made it their business in pretty much every situation to make sure the rules and the regulations of the law are followed, they don't ask this unclean man to leave the synagogue, which he has now defiled, nor do they require him to announce his uncleanness to the crowd. In order to set Jesus up here, they break their own rule about where the unclean are permitted to be. They hypocritically justify breaking the purity law in order to lure Jesus into breaking the Sabbath law. In their minds, the end justifies the means. But I'm bound to tell you that that kind of Machiavellian thinking is never okay. It is never righteous. It wasn't then and it is now. Because it's not permissible for us to lie or to bear false witness or commit any other sin just because it helps our cause and we think our cause is right. Even if our cause is right. That's, right. That's true in the church and in politics and in any other situation. But what these scribes and Pharisees witness in this synagogue on this particular Sabbath makes them Furious. Luke tells us they lose their minds over it. We'll come back to that in a bit. Right now, let's consider the catalyst of the action that takes place here in these verses. And let's ask the man with the withered hand, what are you doing here? Now, first of all, let's consider who this man is. And the truth is, Luke doesn't give us a whole lot of information, a lot of details. Now, like the man born blind and the man with dropsy, we're not given this man's name, nor are we given any other details except that it is his right hand that is with it. Now, no offense to any left-handers 
in the audience, but uh, in the Bible, as in many other places, the right hand is the important one. It's, uh, it's the one that symbolizes the ability to make things happen, the ability to plan and to make things a reality. And sitting at someone's right hand is a place of importance. We, we still speak even today of someone being a, uh, someone's right hand man. Right? That's important. And we talk when we talk about manual dexterity, dexterity, we're using the Greek and Latin words for right. In the Greek here, it's dexios, dexios. And the Latin for the left is sinister. Sinister. So that gives you some idea of what the left is associated with. <laughs> and and this man's right hand, the important one. The one that does the work that a person needs to do to be a contributing member of society is withered. Withered. The Greek that Luke uses is zeros. Zeros. And it refers to something that has shriveled up because it has been starved of nourishment. Like a house plant that you forgot to water. Or a tree. During the drought, you got some plants like that. We've had some plants like that. We went on home vacation, and came back to find them like that. <laughs> Zeros can also refer to a dry, barren desert land. And because of the language that Luke uses, when he tells us the man's hand is restored, we know that this man's deformity is not a birth defect. He has not had it all his life, like the man born blind that we heard about a few weeks ago. Now, this man's deformity happened to him sometime during his life. This man's right hand used to work. It used to be functional. It was full of life and provided him with the ability to earn a living and to greet people with an outstretched hand and to do all the things that he needed to do during the course of a day that most people take for granted. And his infirmity may have been the result of an injury or a degenerative disease, or even poison, lead poisoning, for instance. But we don't know what happened, and Luke doesn't tell us. And, and in fact, this man himself may not even know why it is that he once was whole and healthy and part of the community, but is now deformed and disabled and dismissed. You know, when I was growing up, one of my favorite television shows was a show about the Korean War called MASH. MASH. You may know of it. This is, I think it was shown in this country for a while. It's all about a mobile army surgical hospital, a MASH unit. And one of the characters on that show was called Radar O'Reilly. Radar O'Reilly. They called him Radar because he had a kind of a sixth sense that allowed him to know before anybody else did when the helicopters were bringing wounded soldiers to them. And I don't know how old I was when I noticed this, but Radar always seemed to be holding a clipboard or a teddy bear or, or holding his left hand in such a way that you couldn't really see it. And only very rarely in the show. It only happened, I believe, five times in the whole 11 years that the show was on. 251 episodes that were made only very rarely were you able to see Radar's left hand clearly. And that's because the actor who played Radar, Gary Berghoff, he had a deformity caused by a condition called Poland Syndrome. And he kept his left hand hidden so that the audience wouldn't be distracted. You might not have known that. No, you and as I was reading these verses from Luke's Gospel this week, I thought of Radar's hidden hand. And I thought, this man with the withered hand could also have hidden his infirmity. He could have kept his hand covered or in his pocket. Now, I don't know if rogues in the first century had pockets or not, but you know what I mean. Unlike someone like the man born blind or the man with dropsy, this man could have kept his condition, you know, out of sight. He could have not let people know about it. Of course, according to Jewish tradition, he was supposed to let people know that he was unclean so they could avoid contacting him. But here he is, 
in this city. And even though Jesus and the scribes and Pharisees know who he is, nobody else seems to notice. And it seems to me that they would notice, but no one does. And I just wonder if that's not because he kept his hand out of sight, because he didn't expose his condition at the synagogue. You know, it's human nature to want to keep our infirmities hidden. That may be particularly true at church. You know, most of us don't really want our weaknesses exposed. We're not particularly eager to see, let others see our vulnerabilities. And so I just wonder whether, like most of us, like this man didn't keep his withered right hand hidden. I wonder whether he didn't cover up the loss that he had experienced so that he could come to the synagogue. I suppose most of us assume that this man came to the synagogue to be healed. But Luke doesn't tell us that. And so it's quite possible that this man has simply come to hear the teaching of Jesus. That he's come to be taught and wants to remain unnoticed. Like all the others who must have been in attendance that day. But Luke doesn't even mention them. Luke mentions this particular man who was in the synagogue on this particular Sabbath, even though the implication is that he shouldn't be. He shouldn't be in the synagogue. He shouldn't be in a crowd of people. He shouldn't be anywhere without letting people know that he is to be avoided. He should be begging for alms like other deformed and diseased and disabled people, but he is not in his proper place. For one reason or another, he has left it behind. He has abandoned that station that the social and religious system would relegate him to, and he is in the presence of Jesus. And he's not only in Jesus' presence, he is on Jesus' mind. And he's on the receiving end of Jesus' commands. He's about to be recognized and called out, addressed personally by Jesus, not once but twice. And we can be certain that he has a choice about how he will respond to Jesus when he calls him to do something. When Jesus takes notice of him, when Jesus speaks directly to him and tells him what to do, he could duck and run out of this place. He could hightail it back to the sidelines where the outcasts belong. But he doesn't. That brings us to our third question. And we'll ask of Jesus, what are you doing? Luke gives us our first answer in verse 6. Jesus has come to the synagogue to teach. He's teaching. And there are folks sitting around listening to him. One of whom is the man with the withered hand. And it is not the case that Jesus stops teaching in order to heal this man. Because Jesus is teaching all along. All the way from verse 6 through verse 11. Not only with his words, but also with his actions. But the truth is... Jesus really doesn't do very much in these verses. What I mean is he doesn't perform much physical activity. Even in healing this man, he doesn't grab hold of him like he does a man with dropsy. He doesn't put mud on his eyes like he does the man born blind. Most of what Jesus does here is speaking. But from the words that he speaks, there is a lot to be learned. In these verses, Jesus speaks three times. Twice to the man with the withered hand and once to the scribes and the Pharisees and whoever else was in the synagogue that day. Jesus gives two commands to the man with the withered hand and asks a question of the others. So let's look at these three instances, three times when Jesus speaks. First, first of all, Luke tells us that even though Jesus knew what the scribes and the Pharisees were thinking, you know, they were watching to see if Jesus would desecrate the Sabbath by healing. Even though Jesus knew their thoughts, he addresses the man with the withered hand and tells him, according to the New Revised Standard Version that you have there in your notes, come and stand here. Now I'm just going to tell you that uh, that translation loses some of the power of the original Greek. Because in the original Greek, Jesus says, 
arise and stand in the midst, in the middle of these people, surrounded by them. And the word that Jesus uses that means arise is igairo, igairo, and it means to wake up, to get up, to rise up. It's a word that's used in the New Testament to refer to what happened to Jesus after he was crucified. He was a gyro. He was raised up. He arose. And Luke tells us further in verse 8 that this man got up. He arose. And the word he uses there is enestema. Another word for resurrection. Oh, Luke's telling us a lot more than the fact that this man stood up from a sitting position. Luke is implying that this man is moving from death to life. And he's foreshadowing the fact that Jesus would do the same. Now notice that Jesus commands this man not only to rise up, but to stand in the midst of the people. Now if you consider the suggestion that this man was not particularly interested in drawing any attention to himself. Particularly not in it, exposing himself as stricken with a deformity and therefore unclean. You might wonder whether this man might hesitate just a little bit. He might have wished he had not come to church that morning. Maybe he'd rather blend into the background and not be singled out and made a spectacle of. Surrounded by spectators just looking at him. You ever feel like that? Like you'd be happy just to remain anonymous and not have anybody know too much about you? You know, none of us are particularly eager to have other people know that we are in some way different or that we might have something wrong with us. We prefer to keep that to ourselves. Not particularly eager to let our faults be known. We like to keep our weaknesses hidden. And you know, sometimes Jesus calls us to stand up in the midst of a crowd, even to expose our vulnerability and our brokenness. And when Jesus commands us to do something, we need to do it. And that's what this man does. This man doesn't hesitate. He stands up. He rises up. And you know, everybody in the synagogue was looking at him, examining him. I wonder if that man wasn't thinking Okay, let's get this over with, all right? And I love this next part. Jesus leaves him standing there for a little while. And he asks a question. <clears throat> the scribes and the Pharisees and the crowd there. The man just stands there waiting. Jesus asks, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? To save life or to destroy? Now, notice that Jesus doesn't ask, if it's lawful to do good or not, to save life or not on the Sabbath. He asked, is it lawful to do good or to do harm, to save life or destroy it? He's not giving those he's talking to one option or its absence. He's giving two opposite and opposing options. He's saying that the choice before them is either do good or do harm. In other words, when there is someone before them whose need they can meet, not only would meeting it be good, but not meeting it would be to do harm. When there's a life that can be saved, not saving it is the same as destroying it. Well, this is a powerful way to ask this question. But it seems to me that Jesus is making the same point that James makes in chapter 4 of his epistle when he says, To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. <clears throat> Jesus has given these scribes and Pharisees an either-or proposition. But, unsurprisingly, nobody speaks up with an answer. But they really don't need to. Luke's already told us that Jesus knows their thoughts. And so when Luke tells us that Jesus looks around, looks around at them, that's the only physical action that Jesus does in these verses. We know that he sees 
their answers. He knows what they're thinking. And so Jesus turns his attention again to the man who's been standing there waiting all this time. And he gives him a command. That must have been the last thing that man wanted to hear as he stood there in the midst of those people. All of them staring at him, waiting with bated breath to see what happened next. Jesus says to the man, stretch out your hand. Can you imagine what that man must have thought in front of all these people? You don't understand. See, I do, I do my best to keep this particular part of myself hidden and uh, unexposed. I'm not interested in showing people my weakness and my shortcomings. That's why I carry this clipboard. I keep my hand in my pocket. I don't want people to know that I'm not perfect. But Jesus says, stretch out your hand. The word he uses is ectino. It's the word you use for when you extend your arm way out for something that might be almost out of reach, when you have to extend yourself and make a considerable effort to grasp it. It's also the word you use when you cast a net onto the waters to see what you can catch. Ectino. Jesus says, stretch out your hand. Don't work about exposing your weakness to others because my power is made perfect in weakness. My grace is sufficient for you. That's what the Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And so, the man stretches forth his hand, his withered right hand in front of everybody and everyone else in the synagogue and he too sees that it is restored. Return to the way it was before. The word that Luke uses there means to restore something to its original standing or its original possession, position so it's no longer separated. And so, by following the commands of Jesus, this man is no longer burdened by his loss, by his weakness. He's no longer labeled as one of the diseased and deformed and disabled, but restored and revived and returned to his original standing in the synagogue, in the community, in the family of God. And seeing all this, the scribes and Pharisees lose it. They are Furious. The word Luke uses is annoya. Annoya. The word you use when something might annoy you. Annoya. <laughs> but contrary to what you might think, it doesn't mean to just be annoyed. It means literally to lose your mind. Annoya. It means they lost it. They went crazy. And we might ask why. Was it the fact that all this happened in front of everyone? Was it the fact that Jesus profaned the Sabbath? Because he had, in fact, healed on the Sabbath. Was it, in, was it the fact that they knew the answer to that question that he had asked them? Was it the restoration of an outsider that infuriated them so much? Was it the thought that this man was undeserving? Maybe it was because they had he had taken the attention away from them. I think it was probably all of these. But as we close this morning, I want to suggest to you that here in our Sabbath gathering this morning, we may not have any scribes and Pharisees. Or I know we don't. We may not have the presence of the man with the withered hand. But just as surely as he was in that church back then, the presence of Jesus is here with us this morning. And he is still teaching through his words and actions. Through his spirit, he is still calling hypocrisy into question and infuriating hypocrites. He's still questioning our assumptions and our prejudices. He's still challenging those who may be here only to be seen by others or because they think it's a regulation they have to obey, or even those who think he's a fraud. He's also calling the broken to rise up, even in front of others. Calling us not to keep our weaknesses hidden, but to stretch forth and be healed and restored. 
And the question that we ask of these three this morning can be asked of ourselves. What are we doing here? What are you doing here? I'm going to ask our worship team to come to right now. Let's worship together. Thank you. 
body of Christ. You are the body of Christ. May you have the heart of Christ, tender for mercy. May you have the eyes of Christ to see a world in need. May you have the feet of Christ to bring good news. Go in peace and God go with you. Amen. Thank you all for worshiping with us this morning. I just wanted to remind you all about Harvest Sunday. And I did want to mention, too, this Saturday before, we're having a fundraiser for the food bank at Dunn Memorial from 12 to 3. 12 to 3. Uh, come by. There's going to be great soup and sandwiches and stalls and all kinds of good stuff. So you all take home some potatoes as well. And we'll see you soon.